Uh, friends, good afternoon. I thought that uh, I would begin uh, just after lunch, so that's how I contested myself. But I think the point still holds. The, the media today is not only a newspaper or a television channel or an online platform. And media is far more broad-based today. I'll set that with an example. Even before the US announced its Bin Laden mission and the completion of it, this gentleman to our right, Troy Bathurst, actually was communicating it live, almost giving a day-to-day minute-to-minute -minute account of how the choppers came in, though he did not know what the objective was or what, who the target was. The gentleman to our left, Keith Urban, of course knew what he was doing. At that point of time, he was already a very, very senior, former, very senior government officer, a former chief of staff to a former defense secretary of the U.S. He was told by someone that that mission had been done. And he consciously went and put that tweet out, knowing fully well what he was doing. So the media today is everywhere, because the media today is every citizen. And that is a big shift. It is a fundamental shift. If that is a big shift and a fundamental shift, the second big shift is this, that every company interaction with its audience, with its market, with its consumers, every company associates interaction with its audience today potentially can be captured, can be posted, can be commented upon. So that is a second big shift that is taking place. The third big shift is this. In the last few years, if you look at big issues, big debates, big discussions happening in the corporate world, much, much of that is because of people of an organization. I'll substantiate that point with, if you're familiar with the Holmes Report. I was looking at the Holmes Report 2018 compilation of the world's biggest corporate issues and crises. At least 60% of them. At least 60% of them can be directly related to people issues, to people conduct, both willful misconduct, for example, a smear campaign, defalcation of funds, or, for example, hiding truth, to not willful, but at the same time being unconscious about insensitive statements, insensitive behavior, insensitive responses to different kinds of stakeholders. I'll give you two examples. This large global organization had an issue. It hired an entity to manage the issue. That entity decided that it would do a kind of a smear campaign. People inside the organization who are responsible for managing that entity, rather than forewarning the organization that what could be its repercussions, actually participated in that campaign. And reports are that the head of that team actually ultimately had to lose her job. A second example of what an insensitive, uh, not willful, but being insensitive can do. Here was this organization managing, already managing inside an issue, real serious issue, and suddenly one of its senior people gets onto a television channel and in the course of discussion on that issue makes this comment, people are talking about us as if we have murdered babies in the car murdered babies in the car. That was an insensitive comment, and what was a chatter actually flared up into an inferno. So that is a third big shift, and I would actually submit that more than products and people, uh, more than products and processes, people today are as central to a company's reputation or its illiteracy. And that is where it comes in corporate governance. Corporate governance is usually seen as a system to manage uh, a system to govern, conduct, fiduciary responsibility. 
I would think corporate governance has to expand if people are central to that issue to actually governing people, schooling, coaching, making people do the right thing at every workstation, at every moment, even without being supervised. And if that is so, then corporate communication becomes central to corporate governance. Why so? That is because corporate communication as a discipline has visibility in the entire organization. Manufacturing, marketing, sales, research, uh, finance and accounts, corporate communicators have visibility throughout the organization. That's first. Second, corporate communications are actually networked right from the floors to the CX offices. Think about it. You're all corporate communicators here. We're all corporate communicators here. We use this visibility and network to actually create the narrative for our organization, populate it, and communicate on that narrative. I think the same visibility and network now has to be deployed into actually helping uh, corporate governance, governing organizations. I'll give you an example. Uh, very often, we can notice, let's say, aberrations or deviations from what the company's stated policies behavior practices are. We need to speak out on that. I'll give you an example of, an, of a corporate communication team, which I know of, who did it. The company went out, had gone out and launched a product, much anticipated for a long time, which had captured the imagination of everyone. After the launch of the product, a particular batch of that product, section of that product had a problem. Uh, the company was responding. But the corporate communications team thought that the organization needed to demonstrate and act on it with far more alacrity than it was demonstrating. So one day the team decided that it will go and directly speak to the head of that organization, the chairman of the organization, that the company needs to behave far more uh, proactively with greater alacrity. And I tell you, I'm told that within 12 hours, the company decided to take a string of action and the problem was addressed. The second aspect of what corporate communicators need to do is actually sensitize colleagues to the fact, uh, to the context in which we live, that we live in a 24 into 7 live reality show. We often tend to believe that people know, but very often people do not know, and that's why insensitive ads, insensitive statements, insensitive behavior get uh, done. Look at this example. One of the most famous houses in the world, launching an advertisement which ridicules the eating habits of a particular community in a particular country. And even when is this when this issue has been spoken about, one of the founders of this organization is caught in a conversation, social media conversation, which tended to be racist. This gentleman's firm, Mitzi, had grown up. An apology was due, of course, I'm sorry, we are sorry, but I would like my life back. It led to a flare-up of that crisis. They were dragging a man out of a passenger out of an aircraft. Little did they realize that there were scores of mobile phones out there recording it and putting it out across the world. So behavior, how to behave, how to conduct, how to deal with the world outside, people need to be continuously sensitized. I'll give you an example of how one organization is doing it. This particular organization very often conducts relief operations, disaster relief operations. So every time colleagues go out, the communication team actually sensitizes them, takes a session on how do you actually behave, how do you conduct yourself, how do you sit, stand, do everything when you are with victims in a disaster zone. So would they behave insensitively if they were not forced? Most probably not. Most probably definitely not. But every time when you sensitize, you are making people even more conscious about what is expected. A third aspect of what corporate communication can do, and it happens in every company, misconducts do take place. But we are very often apologetic, uh, wary about making misconduct known because we think that it possibly can lead to, lead to a degree of embarrassment. Some companies 
think a little differently, I can give at least one example of a multinational, 200 years now, which has found a very subtle way of also getting, making misconduct known inside the organization. And as an outsider, when I look at that organization, I very often, in most cases, when generic issues have been uh, debated, I have found that that particular organization has not been called out. So there must be something right that they are doing. Now these are the do's, but to do these do's, uh, I believe that we corporate communications need to ourselves impose on ourselves a certain behavior pattern. And the first of them is to act as an internal activist. How so? I'll give you an example from another organization. Now, through their ORM, this particular organization, the comms team in the organization came to know that a, that a video had been put up of a particular product, and there was a complaint on the quality of the product. That video showed that. So the comms team took it to the marketing guys. And the marketing guys very categorically said that there's nothing wrong with the product. The product cannot even behave in the manner in which the video is trying to sort of show, demonstrate. The comms team very quietly put its foot down and said that while you may be saying so, what we want is that an independent test be done as per norms, a test done at an independent lab, and we want to be armed with the report. At the comms team's insistence it was done, the product of course was fine. So behaving as an internal activist inside organization. The second behavior is this, that we usually tend to trust everyone is trusting. But even as we trust, we need to test. I'll give you an example of uh, what can happen when you trust but do not test. This particular organization, the comms team received a complaint from an NGO, rather activist NGO, that a plant of this organization at a very remote location was not meeting pollution now. So the comms team spoke with its bosses, and then eventually contacted the plant. The plant manager said everything is hunky dory, nothing wrong. So, and this was, this happened at a particular point of time. About three, four weeks later, I believe, this NGO goes out and issues a statement that we have found that this particular company, this particular plant is actually violating norms. Basis, what the plant said, the company issued a denial. A written denial, as much as the NGO put a release out, the comms team also put a release out. Later that evening, that plant manager called and said that I have now noticed violation. That evening, the company shut that plant down, ordered a probe, and eventually in the probe it was found that that particular plant manager himself was the culprit. He knew all around what he was doing. So, no one cross-checked. I have often asked myself this question that why didn't anyone cross-check? And the answer that has come to me that no one has no one cross-checked at that point of time because in that particular organization this kind of a willful misconduct was simply unimaginable. But the lesson that I thought everyone would have learned there is that people can surprise. So therefore, uh, trusting but testing. Now, what are the benefits of corporate communications behaving or acting as corporate governance? I would think there are two benefits. The first is pre-mortem. Now, what is pre-mortem? Pre-mortem is the opposite of post-mortem. Post-mortem happens is basically what happens. Public. Pre-mortem is what can happen. Post-mortem is usually public, leading to issues, leading to crisis. Pre-mortem is internal, where the comms team itself can contribute to raising questions, looking at issues, and plugging gaps if there are any. The second benefit, of course, is very simple, which is enlightened self-interest, as people would say. What is more difficult to do, or what is more easy to do? Stopping a bad story, which has gone bad, gone out, or stopping a story from before it has gone bad? I would think it is much easy, much more easy to stop a story before it is going bad, rather than when it is already gone bad. So to sum up, media is every individual everywhere. We companies 
unconscious to ourselves are actually in a 24 into 7 live reality show. Anyone can post, anyone can capture, anyone can comment on any occasion of a company's interaction. And usually people give vent to an experience is a negative. In recent times, it possibly is that people are the new problem. Corporate governance should extend to governing people behavior, and corporate communications has a role in corporate governance in watching, listening, speaking up, in moving from media training for some to behavior training, plugging ourselves along with our HR colleagues to do behavior training for all, making misconduct known in a very subtle manner. Our behavior should be, our own behavior should be that we should be the internal activist in an organization. As an organization, as a discipline, yes, we will trust, but we must also test. And the benefits of corporate communicators acting as corporate governors is basically that the organization gets to do a free mortem and stories get stopped before they have turned back. Finally, to conclude with just one anecdote, and it's a personal anecdote. I was once in an organization which had a process about announcing its pricing decision. So on one occasion, a colleague called and asked me whether we could deviate from that process. I eventually gave it. And he said that market conditions were very difficult. And we made a decision, we made an announcement. Later in the evening, I was going home. So my MD called and says that uh, I believe we have deviated from our pricing announcement process. So I said, yes, the business was requested. He says, who in the business? So I said that the business, he cut the phone. But before that, he asked me a question, which this happened about 10 years back. It still rings with me that they were Who is the gatekeeper? We corporate communicators are also gatekeepers of our organization. That's why corporate communication is also corporate government. Thank you.